were revolvers actually better weapons for cavalry than sabres were? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now I've just got back from shooting uh, this revolver as it happens. I've just been down the range and this was one of the firearms I was shooting today. This is a replica. This is an Uberti um, Colt 1851 Navy. Uh, these were used by the um, American troops in the American Civil War, even though later models of revolver had come along by that point. These were still, still quite popular. These are percussion lock revolvers. And they were also used by the British, for example, in the Crimean War. Now, you will also know that at this same time, people were using sabers. What I've got here, if I just put the revolver down for a second, is a uh, original. Um, this is part of, part of Eastern Antique Arms stock. Uh, this is an original M1860 cavalry saber, as used by the uh, American cavalry during the Civil War. Now, when we talk about swords and guns on this channel or any other channel, um, there's a lot of debate. People just basically regard in the 19th century these as obsolete weapons and pistols and revolvers in particular as better weapons, fundamentally. And one of the things I always say is, well, you know, first of all, revolvers at that time weren't necessarily the most reliable things in the world. As uh, I can demonstrate with this 51, this is probably the least reliable uh, revolver that um, I own. And it has all sorts of issues in firing. It sometimes jams, percussion caps get stuck in places they shouldn't be, weren't designed to be. Uh, stops the cylinder revolving, which stops the hammer cocking. You can't shoot. So in a moment of combat, these can get out of order very quickly due to percussion caps, as I say, but also fouling. Um, powder residues, um, all sorts of other issues. Okay, so these don't always function when you want them. Uh, moreover, you've only got six shots and they're very slow to reload. Uh, so in close combat, that might be a big, big problem. But in addition, there's this fundamental point of why one or the other, why not both? That's my fundamental um, kind of response. And certainly in a British colonial setting, when we're looking at things like the uh, Adams revolver here, which is much superior revolver to the Colt, I have to say, um, and cartridge revolvers and cartridge versus percussion have different strengths and weaknesses. But fundamentally, why just have a pistol if you can also have a sword? Because swords can do things that don't run out of ammunition. They can do things like block and parry, which if you're in the British Army and you're fighting in places like India, Afghanistan, China, Sudan, Egypt, uh, wherever, where people are likely to be swinging or poking hand weapons at you at close range. Uh, indeed, a sword was something that you can block with at the same time as shooting a person, if you like, is a great, great thing to have. So why not have both? But what's interesting is this discussion of sword versus uh, pistol or revolver is something that came up a lot in the 19th century. And definitely, um, particularly in the American Civil War, there was a preference for firearms over swords uh, to some degree in America. If we look at the British Army or the French Army, which were uh, much more spread all over the globe and generally speaking doing a lot more fighting than the American Army at that time, um, they clearly used swords more than the Americans did. So there was a preference for swords in the British and French militaries um, and uh, Spanish and Portuguese as well, and the Dutch. So all the kind of colonial militaries that were out there kind of in the far reaches of their empires, they still put a lot of value in swords for the aforementioned reasons. But here I found an amazing American source which actually talks about some of this nitty gritty. So rather than just listening to my opinions, I thought it would be really interesting to look at the opinions of a period American source comparing the virtues of revolvers versus swords. So what follows is basically going to be a reading of the original source. This is part of my um, history story time. If you're interested in this kind of content, then there's more of it you can check out. Um, the visuals are going to be minimal from now on. It's just going to be my face and I'm going to be reading. But this is from Volunteer Cavalry, the lessons of the decade, 1871. So it's really talking about lessons from the US Civil War and it's written by Frederick Whitaker. And I'll place that link down below. So Volunteer Cavalry, the lessons of the decade by a volunteer cavalryman. The Sabre. We may say without boasting that at the close of the great civil war in America, the armament and training of our volunteer cavalry on both sides were more practical and efficient than those of regular cavalry in Europe. 
I disagree there. If in drill and personal appearance, many a uh, crack regiment of the latter, Europeans, uh, could surpass them. In a week's hard campaigning over any country at haphazard, one of our regimentals could have marched all around their opponents, decimating them without loss to themselves. <laughs> wow, they're confident. Under the system of raids, our cavalry, with a battery of flying artillery to each brigade, put the whole country in terror for a distance that would require a whole army to influence in Europe. Infantry and artillery of equal force we despised. The mobile and elastic dismounted skirmish line with artillery support it, supports was far superior in destructiveness to the infantry line of battle on account of its rapidity and dash. This is the bright side of the picture. I expose the dark with the great readiness now because the fault is easily remedied in the future. And if so done, our cavalry would be the best in the world. The fault is this. Had one of our cavalry regiments been put into a level plain with no arms but sabres, opposed to a like force of European heavy cavalry, especially cuirassiers, they would in all probability have been routed. Hell yeah, they would have been. I mean, for a start, that's an unfair comparison because cuirassiers wear cuirasses. Um, they would also be, for the most part, using slightly longer and heavier swords, uh, mounted on slightly bigger horses, so pound for pound, this is like a lightweight going against a heavyweight. In fact, it's literally that. He goes on. With lancers opposed to them in the same manner, their defeat would have been almost nearly certain. I agree. Um, deprived of firearms, our cavalry would have been overthrown. Yep, quite likely. The fact is an unpalatable one to an American cavalry officer, and many will utterly deny it from esprit de corps and national vanity, patriotism and pride. But a fact it is, and both the reason and the remedy are simple. The reasons were that our men had little or no confidence with the sabre. The reason of that, again, was that they were never taught to use it properly. The ultimate reason of all, our system of sabre exercise, as laid down in the tactics, is radically bad and our men never fenced together. The remedy is as simple as the reason. Introduce a good system and make your men fence constantly. <laughs> then American cavalry would be second to none other, heavy or light. During the war, many officers contracted a positive prejudice against the use of the sabre, and in some regiments, mostly Confederate, it is entirely laid aside, all charging being done with the pistol. But so far as the author's observation goes, he never remembers an instance in which a sabre charge resolutely pushed failed to drive the pistols. That's really important. He is saying there was literally no case that he was aware of where one side charged with sabre, the other side charged with pistols, where the sabre didn't win. He goes on. But the individual fancy of a colonel generally regulated the matter for his regiment. If he were an enthusiastic swordsman, um, he always managed to infuse the same spirit into his men, and such regiment such regiments depended on their sabres with just confidence. But very few colonels on either side were swordsmen. The sabre is a weapon that requires constant practice to keep one's hand in, and our cavalry officers as a class are entirely deficient in that practice. Hence the contempt for the sabre incal incalculated by a class of men who simply could not handle it. Many officers now advocate the pistol for a charging weapon in preference to the sabre. They insist that a pistol shot kills when a sabre cut only wounds. We have heard officers openly avow the sabre to be useless. In one regiment it was publicly boasted in the writer's hearing that never yet had drawn a sabre in a charge and never would charge with anything but pistols. The slight effects of sabre cuts is noticed by cavalry officers on both sides. Several who have written their own adventures have mentioned, in it their, mentioned in it in their books and have in their turn been quoted by the cavalry compilers. But in all instances during the war in which the sabre proved ineffective, it may safely be asserted that it was owing to two things. Want of fencing practice and blunt sabres. The latter, of course, as much as the former, conducted to this, uh, conduced to this want of confidence in the sabre. The men shrunk from using a weapon with which they had never counter encountered a foe, and they knew also that said weapons would not cut. 
It's a strange fact that after all that's been said and written about sharp sabres by everyone who's written on the subject of cavalry that they still remain in every service known as blunt as ever. Now this is an interesting point. I'll just throw in some of my own experience here because I've handled a lot of American sabres, antique ones, and it's very clear that some of them were sharpened but most weren't. And in fact, this is a good example here of a sword which has had some attempted sharpening done at it, but is not what I would call sharp. So I think we're dealing with three things. I think in some cases there were regimental, cavalry regimental sabres that weren't sharpened at all. There were some that were sharpened, but really badly. And then there was a minority that were actually sharpened well. So clearly the overall effect is going to be that the sabres aren't very sharp and they don't cut very well and that will be pervasive through the whole service. Now he goes on to reference Nolan. Nolan is actually a British cavalry officer who'll be famous to those who know about the charge of the Light Brigade. Um, so Nolan wrote a book called On Cavalry, I believe in 53. I think it was, or 52, but just before the Crimean War. And it was very uh, popular work, widely published and, and read. Anyway, he quotes Nolan. Nolan constantly insists that a sharp sabre will cut in anyone's hand. This was based on experience in India, or, or like from Indian serving officers. And he also quotes the author uh, de Brac, who um, comments something similar in French, which I won't offend your ears with reading with my terrible French. Uh, red tape at the head of affairs remains stolidly impenetrable. Sabres issued blunt enough to ride onto San Francisco. That's a reference to train tracks. The steel is hard. Grindstones are not to be found. The soldiers less uh, lose confidence in the weapon and prefer the revolver, therefore. Now, if the War Department would simply require in um, the future contracts for sabres that they should be delivered each one sharp enough to cut a sheet of paper by striking the paper on, uh, on the sword lightly. The American cavalry of the future would be revolutionized. If whetstones were furnished to the men, um, or what are called scythe rifles, um, a sabre issued sharp would be kept sharp. But as it is, the men cannot keep them sharp. The writer has stood at the grindstone, turned by steam, and tried to grind an Ames, that's a maker, a uh, factory of uh, making sabres and bayonets, uh, grind an Ames sabre for over an hour. He can testify that it's hard, hard work. Uh, the hardest kind of work, but um, if ground while in soft temper at the factory, the, hard, the hardening temper subsequently received would leave them still sharp and easily kept so. I think there's a, there's a misunderstanding of metallurgy there, but regardless, he's basically said, I've tried to sharpen this and didn't do a very good job of it. Um, basically, he's not a professional sharpener, and if professional sharpeners sharpened them, they'd be sharp. Um, and there's no fear um, but that the men, with very little looking after, would keep them so. Soldiers are fond and proud of good weapons and take good care of them. All men are apt to be vain of bodily strength and skill. It gives a man a braver feeling to cut down an adversary than to shoot him. And by just so much as he trusts to his sword, his morale will be raised also. That the sword may be made a murderous weapon when sharp, we have no need to quote Nolan. A more recent book, unconnected with military science and therefore unwarped by prejudice, gives testimony, testimony on this point. Uh, convincing to anyone. Sir Samuel Baker, the bold traveller, who discovered the ultimate source of the mysterious Nile, so long sought in vain, has published a book of his adventures on the Blue Nile and its tributaries of Abyssinia. This is another book which is available on Google Books, incidentally, in which he gives a full account of the Hamram Arabs of that region who hunt all kinds of game with no other weapon than the simple sabre. In fact, it's a double-edged broadsword, but anyway. Uh, three or four of them combined are sufficient to kill the most vicious male elephant if they catch him in the open. They hesitate not to attack the lion in the same way and with equal success if he too is caught in the open. Their swords are Solingen blades. Solingen in Germany, famous for making sword blades and quite common in the United States as officer swords, very true. It costs a poor Hamran um, Arab half a life's labor to buy a new one, and they're hounded down from father to son as heirlooms. It, they're fancy to have them straight and cross-hilted, much like a cascara, in fact, it probably is a cascara, unlike the equally keen uh, Damascus scimitar. But the remarkable fact about these swords is their wonderful cutting power. 
The cutting power arises simply from their being kept as sharp as razors, literally. So Samuel Baker says that an Arab's first care after a march is to draw his sword and strop it to and fro on his leather shield. He never rests and satisfied until with it he can shave off some hairs off his bare arm. This shows to what keenness of edge our own weapons might be brought. No mysterious Damascus steel, but the familiar Solingen sabre, which is advertised daily in every military gazette. And we have no doubt that the Ames blades from Chicopee, Massachusetts, could be brought to an equally fine edge with care. Now for the performances of these weapons. On one occasion, a wild boar at bay created so much trouble amongst um, Baker's party. He charged a German servant who awaited his attack and got knocked over by the animal but put in uh, imminent danger of his life. Uh, At this juncture, Abu Do, one of the um, people in attendance, leaned over from his horse and let his sword drop over the hog's back, nearly dividing the animal in half. On another occasion, chasing a rhinoceros, it gets into the bushes after a hard race, but just as it's almost gained the cover, Tahir Sharif, another of the people accompanying, sprang almost out of the saddle and made a blow. A gash nearly two feet in length appeared in the rhinoceros's quarter, etc. We quote from memory, but the <laughs> verbiage is uh, the only inaccuracy. The facts are as stated. Tahir Sharif, with a single blow, cut deeply enough into the colossal leg of an old elephant to divide the tough back sinew and hamstring the animal, who bled to death in 10 minutes. Lovely. Uh, the artery being divided. And in the Arab fights, men are quite frequently cut in two at the waist, Baker informs us. If our men had weapons like that, that which they might have uh, without expense almost, we could have no more of these useless sabres. A sabre should be kept as sharp as a razor. No halfway ought to be allowed. It can be done and it ought to be enforced. Fancy our men armed with razors three feet long. What ghastly wounds they could inflict on the enemy. The very first fight when every accidental slash would open a gash a foot long, and how shy any enemy would fight of such men, in other respects well, in other respects well armed and horsed. And you know, you might be thinking that this is fanciful, but if we look at combat in India, this is exactly borne out. The fact is that some amazing wounds were caused by really sharp swords, and it did have a uh, effect on the morale of the enemy. Uh, when you know that uh, the opponents have swords that can do these sorts of things, are going to charge home with them, uh, it changes everything about how you fight. In the cavalry of the future, these three-foot razors, if ev ever a man is found to introduce them, will be the greatest innovation of modern world warfare since gunpowder. I love that statement. So the greatest innovation since gunpowder is sharp swords. Now, more interesting, uh, it goes on. But the greatest cause of the superiority of the sabre will be in its moral effect. Morale becomes more and more every day the secret of modern warfare. Every new weapon which is invented, if good for anything, is immensely exaggerated in its moral effect. The needle gun has frightened 10 men off the field for every one that it's actually killed, because it's reported to be far better than it is. Its effect at close quarters in the open field were awful. At long ranges and in wood skirmishing, the muzzle loader could have held its own besides shooting stronger. But the morale effect, moral effect, he actually says, of the needle gun scared away the Austrian Jaegers. Get a man well scared and give him a 30 shot repeating rifle and a dozen revolvers and he'll run like a hare from an old brown bess in the hands of his moral superior. This is a great insight, I think. And it is, I think we get obsessed about the effectiveness of weapons, but very often it comes down to morale. You need men to stand and fight. And if they think that the enemy is more fearsome and more effective than they actually are, half the battle's already won. He goes on, a good sound thrashing, whatever weapons are used, leaves a great respect for them in the mind of the thrashed party. I've heard men armed with breech loaders talk longingly of the advantages of the muzzle loading long Enfield rifle, because that rifle had been the instrument of their thrashing the day before. 
Now, the moral effect of a charge is tremendous. The fierce charging yell, rising and swelling higher and higher until it overtops the sound of musket musketry, frightens more men than bullets do. Very, very few troops will stand up against a charge supported by works. We might say none. One side or the other is sure to give way, not from the force of the weapons, but simply because they're afraid. And anything which encourages men to charge home doubles their morale, and morale is everything. It was morale which, after the first victory at Worth, gained by overwhelming numbers, about four to one on the field, made the subsequent Prussian successes so much easier to gain over the French in 1870. In that battle, the celebrated Zouaves were forced into a complete rout for the first time in their history. That corps had, up to that day, been considered the most desperate fighters in all of Europe, and practically invincible. They really were so, in any ordinary circumstances. Their morale had made them twice as formidable as they really were. But, under the shock of numbers, absolutely impossible for human, human beings to stand against, they were routed at last. His morale was shaken to dissolution, and with it sunk the morale of the whole French army. The men who could conquer their unparalleled Zouaves must be devils incarnate. So the French troops became easier to defeat every day, as bad generalship completed the wreck of their morale. And as others felt, so rose their adversaries. This is always the case. A scared enemy, after the loss of one battle, is half beaten before he enters the next, and the attacking party in nine battles out of ten is the victor. So with our cavalry of the future, give them a weapon which they know to be irresistible at close quarters, and they'll be only too anxious to charge home. A charging regiment with three-foot razors will not lose half as many men as its opponents, the, the pistol chargers. Half the pistol shots are thrown away, that means miss it, missed. Um, fired from a galloping horse, a galloping horseman who passed like a flash. Mixed up in a melee, the pistol chargers will so soon learn to give a wide berth to the razor bearers, and to do so, they must run away. Now, a runner soon gets demoralised. It may be said, and I've heard it triumphantly instanced by an officer on the pistol side of the argument, that the revolver men may run away before the others and then turn on them with their pistols as soon as the swordsmen halt to rally to the recall. Instances of the sort had occurred in the, in the officer's knowledge, which had given him that opinion. He had seen a regiment so served. But the sabre charge was not pushed in real earnest, and the men had, so, had no confidence in their weapons. Had each man carried a sword with which he knew he could cut his enemy in half at the waist with a good backhander, um, the revolver-armed enemy would not have escaped so gaily laughing, as the narrator said. The moral effect of those three-foot razors would have kept them at very long shots, and a cavalry charge become a thing far more dreaded than it is now. We have entered into this question fully, as its importance demands, but without boring the reader with a long list of instances. It's subject on which we could contend that grave misapprehension exists. We have good sabres and excellent steel. The mere enforcement of what every cavalry officer must admit to be a good rule would at once work a revolution in the cavalry of the future doubling its morale. So, to cut a long story short, he says the sabres have got to be really sharp and the men should practice. And if those things are done, then his belief is that the sabre charge is far more powerful than the pistol charge. Now we're going to look at his section on the revolver. Now some of what he says here might surprise you, given what he's just said about the sabre. So, the revolver. Without any doubt, the introduction of the revolver into cavalry service has doubled the destructive power of the latter, and of all revolvers introduced, the old Colts is by far the best. It shoots straight. No other revolver that I'm acquainted with is sighted with the precision of Colts. Many others shoot as strong, some even stronger. Many are loaded with much more facility, much more easily, and more easily cleaned. But the fact remains that for, uh, for active service, Colts revolver will be adjudged the best pistol extant by any and every officer or man who has had to stake his life on his weapons. So clearly he's a fan of Colts here. I'm actually not. I think a lot of people I know who shoot prefer Remingtons to Colts if we're talking just about American revolvers, and British people certainly preferred Adams and Beaumont Adams to Colts. In fact, 
Colts had to close down their business in Britain because Adams and um, uh, Beaumont, the Beaumont Adams revolver basically pushed the, the Colt out of service. Um, I think it's really interesting, <laughs> given that uh, he sounds like a Sabre fanboy in the first bit, at least a sharp Sabre fanboy, that in the second bit he then says, but revolvers <laughs> have made the cavalry doubly as effective. So what the hell's going on here? I think you've got to bear in mind that what he's talking about is the current sabers. So he's saying that given that we our cavalry don't practice with their sabers and they don't sharpen their sabers properly, given those facts, the revolver has made them more effective. Now, I'm not going to read the whole revolver section, but he does pick out some interesting other details. He says, in the hands of the Southern Cavalry, so the Confederate States during the Civil War, um, the revolver became their pet and pride. The terrible use to which it was put in broken ground at close quarters by Mosby's troopers doubled its real efficiency by its moral strength. Again, he's talking about morale. Our future cavalry will do, do well to accept the lesson taught by this fact. The true use of the revolver lies in irregular warfare, where single combats and sudden encounters of small parties take place on horseback, in narrow lanes, among woods and fences, where the sabre cannot be used. So he is talking about a specific type of hit and run tactics warfare here. He's not talking about the classic cavalry charges, the mass cavalry engaging other cavalry. In that instance, I think he's made a strong argument for why the sabre might be a better weapon. And again, when we have these discussions about European warfare experience versus American warfare experience, context is always king. You have to look at how was American cavalry often used and how was European cavalry often used? Not always the same, and cavalry used in different ways can lead to completely different conclusions about what's the best weapon for them. He goes on to say, in such places and wherever regular order is broken up, the revolver is invaluable. In pursuits, patrols and surprises, it is superior to the sabre. In line charges in the field, the latter is always the conqueror if it's sharp. So he, whether you agree or not, he's making a very strong point. He considers in lots of types of skirmishing and irregular warfare, hit and run stuff, the revolver's a better weapon than the sabre, but in line charges and driving home a charge, uh, and also against infantry incidentally, the sabre is a better weapon, if it's sharp. So I'm going to conclude this video there. I think I've given, there's more information. If you want to check out that link below, he gives a lot more information about revolvers and training with them. Um, he, I think I've read all of the information he gives about sabers. There might be a little bit later in the book. But the fundamental point is this. Look, we often get into this debate of one or the other. And the fact is that throughout certainly most of the second half of the 19th century and uh, with single shot pistols and uh, abrasive pistols in the first half of the 19th century, cavalry generally had a pistol and a sword and they're both useful in different ways and at different times and the one thing that he doesn't touch on as far as I've seen in this book is the issue of reloading as well and the fact is in the field you've only got six shots with things and he does mention especially when you're riding on horseback and you're trying to pap shoot at other cavalry who are also moving around on horseback hitting them is not easy and you've only got six shots and from personal experience with my own revolver here not all of those shots will necessarily go off. A percussion cap can burst and sometimes the, the chamber doesn't ignite. Um, sometimes you can get a jam, you can get a blockage, all sorts of other things. So apart from missing, apart from mechanical failure, and human failure, of course, uh, involved in the missing, um, the fact is that you've only got six shots. So even if those six shots hit their mark and all work, at that point, you're now riding around on a horse, still in action, presumably with no real easy way of reloading. He does talk about pre-prepared uh, paper cartridges and he actually uh, is not a fan of those for reasons you can read in the book. So the fact is even if you use the pistol as a preference in whatever scenario, having this as a backup is just a generally damned good idea. Particularly, and this is American warfare he's talking about, particularly even something like the Franco-Prussian War as well, which is not that dissimilar to the American Civil War. But if we look at colonial warfare, where the opponents might massively outnumber the European forces, or should we say the European headed forces, uh, controlled forces, uh, in some cases, you know, it might be two to one, three to one, four to one, might be all the way up to eight, ten to one. Uh, the fact is that you've only got a certain number of shots. And yes, you can carry multiple revolvers 
and some forces did this, the Confederates uh, sometimes did this. Um, but fundamentally, there's also this point he comes to, there's a question of range here. And when it's cavalry versus cavalry, or sometimes even cavalry versus infantry, at point blank zero range, by that point, you've not got all of your shots left, probably, and at that range, this sabre is going to be just as reliable, probably, as a pistol in many cases, and you, it encourages the men to drive home the charge. So it also has a morale effect and a physical effect. And this is why bayonet training, certainly in the British Army, I know it's been abandoned in some um, militaries, but in the British Army, the thinking is bayonet is still taught as a charge thing, as a last ditch thing, because it delivers you to the opponent. So rather than standing off and trying to shoot the person from 20 yards away, you actually go in there. Think of this like a game of rugby or American football. You plow in there and you get in there and you get stuck in. And that means you're taking ground. Um, and with a cavalry charge, driving it home instead of pulling up short and standing there and shooting. If you want to do that, it's easy to do it with swords and lances and actually get the troops to do that. And the, moral eff the morale effect on the opponents is going to be stronger as well than, than you standing off and shooting at them uh, from a distance. Anyway, I hope this has been an interesting and enlightening video. I have been Matt Easton, I'll continue to be. Um, your comments, observations, additional data, corrections, anything else are welcome down below in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope to see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.